Number 10. Superman kills Zod. No, not that one time. No, Clark has killed Zod before. There was a precedent, but not as a member of the Neck Snap Club. So in the 1980s, John Byrne rebooted Superman. In the comic, his origin was retold. Some characterizations were also tweaked. It was more of a tonal shift than anything. It was a new era for the Man of Steel. He was a different man, not the super jerk of the Silver Age and early Bronze Age. This new origin was actually far more in line with the 1978 movie and its 1980 sequel that also featured Zod. It was particularly in line when it came to depictions of Krypton. So Clark when he learned of other Kryptonians and their histories and about Zod, decided that he was going to carry out the sentences that had been handed down to them. And so he executed Zod in the Phantom Zone with Green Kryptonite. And then he proceeded to have much angst about it. He even exiled himself to space, because you know, death matters. So this went too far because, well, it took Superman out of commission. The Earth was just there because of this. I mean, he could have just left them in the zone. Zod came back anyway via retcon, so way to waste a death. Number 9. Flashpoint, Barry Allen. So Flashpoint is the the event that leads directly into the New 52, and it was all started off because Barry decided he had to go save his mom. Now on one level, that's super sweet, but on another, was he replaced by a pod person? When you're a superhero who deals in the mystic and the super science on the regular, you know that time travel is not something you should just mess around with. It always has zany consequences. It's never something little like, oh, cinnamon rolls are now the national dish. It's always, oh, you're not the Flash, and Bruce Wayne died, and Atlantis and Themyscira are about to destroy each other and the world. So yeah, Barry created a separate timeline that even erased his protege Wally West from existence, along with so many kids and families, as his mom was dead. He was clearly not following the Vulcan creed about the needs of the many. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. Unless it's your mom, am I right? Up top. Number 8. Spider-Man rips off a face for Kane. Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and Kane have an interesting relationship. Kane is one of his clones from the Clone Saga, and was initially a crazed, unstable killer capable of the mark of Kane, which is where he used acid hands to burn off people's faces. So it would come as a shock to some that during the Spider-Man Grim Hunt, Kane would end up sacrificing himself for Peter, who was being hunted by the family of Kraven, the hunter. And Peter was wearing his black costume at the time so you know what that means, he's hyper aggressive. So he hunts down Craven's daughter, well the whole family, but he ends up ripping off her face as a kinda, that's for you Kane, all for you buddy, best clone, I took her face off. Just intense. This is one of those modern black symbiote suit stories, so they're upping the ante quite a bit. Number 7. Booster Gold, The Gift. Another time traveler abusing their power. Look, time travel really just needs to be given to voyeurs, just people who are not going to mess with stuff. Do you want to wake up with fish hands? Because this is how you wake up with fish hands. So the gift storyline for many was when they started to question is Tom King okay? This started in Batman 45 in the lead up to the Bat-Cat wedding that never happened. Booster got Bruce a gift, a horrible alternate timeline, because he made it so that Bruce Wayne's parents didn't die in an alley. Listen, Booster, there are some heroes who can have their origins altered and some who can't. Superman, Batman, over at Marvel Spider-Man, leave them alone. The effects of this timeline were weird too. There was still a Batman, but it was Dick Grayson, and Selina couldn't speak for some reason and was all hisses and grunts. It sure was a story that I read. Time travel plots are hard to pull off, and they're not all created equal. There are so many at this point that when one flops or is just meh, it stands out. Booster, next time just get him a normal gift like a tie or a coupon from massage. Number 6. Daredevil Becomes Kingpin So Daredevil has been fighting crime in Hell's Kitchen for quite some time now, and sometimes it gets to him. It's all too much. Such was the case during the Bendis run when he came to Hell's Kitchen, beat Kingpin within an inch of his life, and went, look at me. I'm the kingpin now. That's right, he took over Hell's Kitchen. Now some of you may be saying, earned, how is this going too far? Well, it was the fallout. Like all the gangs or even the kingpin were going to just take this lying down, not likely. So there was a lot of collateral damage from this, and Matt would even have his identity revealed. It was all really just a lot of a lot. It's a favorite arc for many, but still too far, Matty, too far. Number 5. Spider-Man Stabbed Deadpool So Spider-Man and Deadpool had a team-up series, Spider-Man Slash Deadpool and for a period versus when they weren't on as good terms. It ran for 50 issues. So during this whole thing, which largely occurred because of the pair's popularity as a ship, people love them some Spidey Pool, and the comic does at times pander, but back to the point. Deadpool is bending over backwards to prove to Spidey what a good person he is and that he deserves his friendship. He is to the point where he's willing to be a punching bag for Peter's issues. Peter, well, he's working through some things, including feeling like part of his life is wrong or missing. Thanks, Mephisto. And at one 
some point when he's careening more into violence and Deadpool calls him out for it, he stabs him right through the chest. He actually kills him, but it's Deadpool so he gets better. Peter played pretty fast and loose with Deadpool's healing factor in this series. Stabbing your friends? Too far. Number 4. Professor X fakes his own death. So we have so many Professor X moments to choose from and I went with this early one. It's a classic from Uncanny X-Men number 42, where Professor X dies in the arms of his devastated X-Men. But psych, he wasn't actually dead. The X-Men, these teens and young adults, just go it alone for 20 issues. Then Professor X just shows back up and was like, I was in the basement. He hid in the basement the entire time, cause he was planning for an alien invasion. The person who actually died was Changeling, a reformed villain who wanted to redeem himself before dying of a terminal illness. So Professor X was like, wanna help me fake my own death? Hero style? So two things, you could just have told them to leave you alone and then subtly push them to do it with your powers if you really needed them to never bother you. Two, you could read their thoughts like all that morning from the basement the entire time or just like, nope, I'm staying down here. That's cold. Number Three, Reed, the Council of Reeds. So you've heard about the Council of Reeds, where Reed joined up with a bunch of other versions of himself. So this council was formed by three Reeds, all with infinity gauntlets, and eventually the 616 Reed joined. But all these Reeds ended up in a battle with Celestials, and most of the Reeds died in this battle. Now our Reed deactivated the bridge after finding he couldn't give up his family the way the others had. So well, how is this too far? Well, he didn't tell his family, and one day his daughter Valeria snuck into the lab and reactivated the bridge, and so there were like four Reeds who had survived. And they crossed over and died. Tell your family things so they don't accidentally open portals to other worlds and unleash evil. Number two, Miss Marvel and the Teenage Gestapo. So Miss Marvel got pulled into Civil War II just like everyone else, but in her book it got weird. Now Miss Marvel really looks up to Carol Danvers. She used to want to be her, hence her taking on her name when she got her embiggened Terrigen Mist powers. But when Carol shows up in her books, it's for Civil War II purposes and to tell her to be part of what's basically a Teenage Gestapo. You know, Ulysses predicting crime before they happen, Minority Report. So basically it's a group of teens going around and policing their friends and neighbors, arresting them, taking them from their homes, and taking them to a warehouse prison outside the town. And at first Miss Marvel is like, let's do this, and yup, people get arrested. Even people that she knows personally, and it's just this whole arc. She eventually backs out, but she's still scarily loyal to Carol. She will lie to her family and beyond for her, and Carol makes her. It's just, did people think the implications of all this through? The worst part about this, and why both she and it went too far is that it derailed the book. This event just stopped it cold and it took a while to get back on track. It's a bad look. So what's worse than arresting your friends before they can do anything because you're just following orders? Well, number one, Wally West, Heroes in Crisis. Murder. So just everything with Heroes in Crisis vacillated so much. Some of it was really good and some of it was really terrible. So Heroes in Crisis was largely a murder mystery, so spoilers. But we finally discovered that the person who killed all the people at the secret sanctuary therapy session location was Wally West, a love flash from the late 80s and early 90s, who Dan Didio has been trying to kill for at least a decade. Wally read through all the patient files of the sanctuary at once, even though the files were supposed to be deleted, and all of that angst and out of characterness for some of the people made him go insane. He lashed out and killed a bunch of them, heroes and villains alike. Then he time traveled to kill himself later in the timeline to bring that corpse back to cover it up so it looked like he died too. Ladies and gentlemen, the hero who brought us Rebirth. This whole thing was just a slap in the face for Wally fans, and for many it felt like forced pathos, and just too far. Wally was a hero and a kind soul, it just all felt very contrived. Lots of Heroes in Crisis does, and some of the continuity is really wonky. Now some people love this arc, and that's great. Everyone is approaching comics from a different stance and perspective, but as someone who has had Wally as the Flash their entire life until Barry's rebirth in the early 2000s, hashtag not my Wally. Number 10, Identity Crisis, Mind Wipe. So many heroes were involved in this, so many. Zatanna does the actual wiping, but Hawkman, Black Canary, The Flash, Elongated Man, Green Arrow, and Green Lantern all help and Superman knows about it. So Identity Crisis is a murder mystery that opens with the murder of Sue Dibney, the wife of the elongated man. As the story unfolds, we learn of a terrible event from the Justice League's history. One evening up on the watchtower, Sue Dibney was up there, and Dr. Light snuck up there. He sees her and rapes her, as the plot says to. So when the heroes come upon this, they decide it is so heinous, Zatanna should wipe his mind and alter his personality, so he never hurts someone like that again. While this is happening, Batman beams up and is horrified by what they are doing, so they mind wipe him too. This event leads to him becoming paranoid and distrustful, as he knows something happened.
happen but not what, and it turns Dr. Light into a brain addled idiot. So yeah, wiping someone's mind is definitely crossing a morality line, but wiping the mind of one of your closest allies because they were calling you out on it, which probably means you should have thought about it more, definitely crossing the line. Number 9. Green Arrow and Cry for Justice Cry for Justice in general went too far for many fans. This is the miniseries that infamously killed Leanne Harper, Roy Harper, Arsenal, formerly Speedy's daughter. Just for shock value, really. It was quite awful, and then she was retconned out of existence, so Roy could be a relatable teen with a baseball cap. Progress. Now the cap's backwards. Cry for Justice involved a couple of members of the Justice League, most notably Green Arrow and Green Lantern, who are friends despite not being able to stand each other, quitting the League to go after the Secret Society, which would put them on a collision course with Prometheus. This is the extreme cliff notes, by the way. Prometheus is like the inverse Batman. His criminal parents were killed by cops, so he turned to a life of crime. Anyway, it's his actions that lead to Leanne's death and forces the heroes to let him go, or he'll kill even more innocents. Green Arrow encourages the rest of the League to let him go, but then hunts down and kills him. Now I mean he indirectly killed a little girl, but there's always been collateral damage. For Arrow to go and kill him now because it impacts the lives of people he knew, like his former ward who he wouldn't even help when he found out he was on drugs, no it was Hal who helped. But now he'll kill for his loss? Not only over the line, but selfish. But Cry for Justice is from 2009. Lots of edgy stuff is happening then. Although some of you may be with Arrow in this, it all got retconned away anyway. But Leanne never came back. Sadness. Number 8. Reed joining the Illuminati. Really anyone who joined the Illuminati. The Illuminati was a secret Marvel team comprised in its first iteration of Namor, Tony Stark, Reed Richards, Black Bolt, Professor X, and Doctor Strange. So why did I single out Reed? There's reasons, wait for it. The Illuminati wanted to find a way to deal with impending global threats or universal threats before they happened, a secret advanced squad who would decide the best course of action for everybody. Reed's solution to this was to go get the Infinity Gauntlet, with the stones for it rather, the gem which he was planning to wish out of existence. Upon finding he couldn't, he divided up the gems amongst the members. No more gauntlets for Reed. So many Reeds on the Council of Reeds had gauntlets. All of these behind the scenes machinations would play into secret invasion and civil war. For all the repercussions this group ended up having, and what a dictatorial combination they would prove to be later on, yes, Reed and the Illuminati went too far. Number 7. Wolverine kills Hank Pym Time travel is a tricky thing, and when you mess with it, you would better be prepared for the fallout. In the 616 comic version, First, Hank Pym is the creator of Ultron, the sentient android who would grow to be one of the big villains in the Marvel Universe. So in 2013, it had actually succeeded in conquering the Earth of an alternate universe. This storyline was called Age of Ultron, or AU for short, which works because in fandom AU stands for alternate universe, so layers. The heroes of this conquered world end up finding a time travel solution and Wolverine would be the one to go back and attempt it. Why? Because they have poor judgement, also he kind of forced their hand. Wolverine's solution was just to kill Pym before he could finish his work. The only thing is this ended up having a ripple effect and making the timeline worse and threatening the entire multiverse. The other heroes warned him about this. This is why Cyclops has to be so abrasive. Wolverine never listens to him. Nearly redestroying the world and messing up the multiverse because you wouldn't listen to others? Going too far. Number 6. Daredevil kills Bullseye. Death. Death everywhere. This happened in the 2010 storyline Shadowland. This story featured a dark daredevil just returning from Japan, which in Marvel always makes you brutal. Just look at Wolverine or Ronin. He decides to use the hands techniques to keep Hell's Kitchen safe, parts of which had been destroyed during the Dark Reign storyline by Bullseye. So he would seek Bullseye out and kill him in the same manner that Bullseye had killed Elektra years prior, stabbed right through the heart, all while wearing his new dark evil looking ninja black daredevil outfit. Daredevil has also killed the Kingpin, after which he stood over the body and told the approaching news crews, I tried everything else. Of course, everybody got better and Daredevil would go back to his code in an attempt to be better than the criminals he pursues. And I for one am glad, Dark Daredevil is scary. Brutally murdering your enemies in front of people? Too far. That's anti-hero stuff. Number 5. Jon Stewart kills Mogo Let's get some love for some other Green Lanterns going too far. It can't always be Hal murdering the core and snapping Sinestro's neck. So back during all the War of Light emotion spectrum stuff that was going on, Jon Stewart had an indigo ring. So compassion. Him and Kyle Rayner, who had the blue ring of hope, were facing off against Mogo, who had been corrupted by Krona. Long story short, he was trying to free the entities that powered the rings. It was a whole thing. The point? Mogo delivers rings to new recruits, and he was being corrupted and sending out corrupted ones, sucking lanterns into his gravitational pull. Everything. So Jon Stewart, 
compassionate soul that he is, decides there's no other way except to channel black energy, the energy of death, and destroy Mogo, all while Kyle is begging him to find another way. This is one of those we need drama moments, cause you get the cool panel of Mogo exploding, which does look good. There are no stakes, Mogo is fine. But for not even trying to find another way, even while wielding the ring of compassion, too far. Though some would say necessary. Number 4. Professor X Erasing Vulcan There were so many choices for Professor X, but I decided on this one cause of the implications and ripple effects. Vulcan is the sibling of Havoc and Cyclops that they never knew about. Vulcan was abducted from his mother's corpse and hyper aged in an induction chamber. He's not okay. So extremely long story short. Vulcan was part of a wave of mutants sent by Professor X to Krakoa. It all goes wrong and so Xavier wipes the memory of Vulcan and the mission from everyone's minds. This was especially significant for Cyclops, who would learn that he had a brother and that his existence had been kept from him for his own good. A lot of this has been retconned in terms of the how and the why in Welk Krakoa, but the mind wipe remains. And it was part of the big rift of mistrust that formed between Cyclops and Professor X, and we know where that led. Magneto was right, killing Xavier, mutant Hitler. So erasing people minds for their own good, which means deciding what is good for them too far. And how many times has he done this? How many more retcons are we going to pull out? Number 3. Batman kills the KG Beast Batman doesn't kill anymore, not since the golden age you cry. But oh no, there are pockets, stories here and there where Batman finds he must take a life. And the KG Beast arc was one of them, although like everyone else he got better. I just want someone to stay dead. Is that too much to ask? I'll get a crowbar. In this arc, the KG Beast was sent by the Soviets to assassinate Ronald Reagan. So Batman knows that if he captures the KG Beast, well, he'll just go back to Russia and nothing will happen. So he lures him into a death trap in the sewer. When the KG Beast offers him the chance to fight the death, he just shuts him in the sewer, leaving him there to starve to death. Cold. Ice cold. This was even before Jason died, but seeing this, can we really be surprised by how Jason turned out? He was watching people starve to death in the sewer. Only he didn't, so it's fine, I guess. Number two, Civil War II. All of it and everybody in it. So, this drama about whether or not the inhuman with precognitive abilities, Ulysses, should be used to preempt crimes was a mess, and everybody went too far. So, behind the scenes, writers only had at most four months to plan this entire event, and it shows. Motivations are weak, and characters suffer because of it. Carol Danvers becomes a complete fascist who gets many heroes on her side killed. Hawkeye would be convinced to kill Bruce Banner by Bruce Banner. Rick Jones would die. Carol would beat Tony into a coma. And none of it mattered. Unlike the first Civil War, which had stakes for everyone, like immediate stakes, while this arc could have had the same thing if it was presented differently, it didn't happen because it was presented as, oh no, my boyfriend died, and I don't wanna feel that way again. Arrest everyone before they do anything. Versus Tony being like, hey, that's bad, don't do that. Didn't you learn from what I did in the first Civil War? Don't be me. It's just all the heroes fighting amongst themselves and was very poorly received. So, what could be worse than that? Why the first time this happened? Number one, Civil War. So this was supposed to be a story where both sides would have valid points and we should all come away enriched. Nope. Let's go through some of the things. So Tony manipulated Spider-Man to revealing a secret identity, then bailed out when there were repercussions. Him and Reed constructed a secret interdimensional prison in the negative zone where they housed criminals and superheroes who wouldn't register. This was mostly Reed. Captain America arranged a meeting between the two where he was like, what if we just took him out. They were best friends before this, by the way. This arc was in no way nuanced. From the start, it was just Tony is wrong and Cap is right. And then Tony lived down to that. Also, even in how it first escalated, with Cap being declared a traitor because Maria Hill asks him if he's here for all this registration, and he mentions no because he lived through World War II and has seen what registering can do. Then she just declares him a traitor and pulls gunmen on him. Gunmen who were already waiting, by the way. Also, Reed and Hank Pym made a clone of Thor so that they could have a brute member for their side since Thor was dead and they had just recently shot the Hulk into space. No one looks good here. Everyone went too far. This would lead to things like one more day and just a mess all around. It also deserves number one because it failed to deliver on its promise of being a thought provoking, nuanced event. You have to pull out of it to discuss the nuance because the comic sure doesn't. It's too bad because it really is an interesting issue. Namor. Namor is a complex figure. Originally a bad guy, fans thought he was so compelling with his twisted sense of justice that the writers had him flip sides to fight the Third Reich, as was the fashion at the time. And so, 
Technically speaking, Namor became one of Marvel's very first anti-heroes, which is why he's earned the first spot on this video. He's not your typical do-gooder. See, he's fine with offing folks if it gets results. And that's not all. Despite his heroic change of heart, Namor typically swings back to his villainous ways every now and then, and when he does, he does some serious damage. Like there was that time in Avengers vs. X-Men when he went nuts with power after being given the Phoenix Force and literally wiped out Wakanda. Then there was that time he ordered a giant humanoid whale giganto to smash New York City to pieces, and one time he even pushed the button to detonate an entire alternate Earth populated at all. Dude really does not give a darn about civilian casualties, so to say that this underwater powerhouse isn't one to play nice is definitely a vast understatement. He's not as calculatedly brutal as some other Marvel heroes, but his hot-headedness and aggression sure make him a wild card in the Marvel world. A fish out of water in the hero game swimming in a sea of moral ambiguity, all puns intended. Next up is Red Hood. Jason Todd, once Batman's Robin, took a dark turn after a brutal encounter with the Joker. His turn towards the dark side came as a result of fans getting to vote on whether he lived or perished in a comic storyline back in 88. And you can guess which one they chose, with the boy wonder meeting his end when the Joker snuffed him out with a crowbar. Fast forward years later and Jason came back from the dead with a grudge. Reborn as the Red Hood, he ditched the whole hero thing and went on a revenge spree. He wasn't playing nice anymore. Gone were the days of just catching crooks. No, no, now he was all about taking out his enemies with no mercy. And boy oh boy his list of enemies was long. He antagonized his Robin successors, he blamed Batman for not offing the Joker, thinking Bat let the Joker slide. In fact when he first came back he absolutely brutalized the Joker in Under the Hood, even pulling the same crowbar trick that the Joker had used on him. And then he went on to force Batman into an ultimatum deciding whose life should be spared, his own or the Joker's. Later in the story Battle for the Cowl, he took on the Batman mantle in Bruce Wayne's absence and committed some horrifying crimes in Batman's name and image. Even though he's gone from teaming up with villains to being more of an anti-hero, the Red Hood's quest for payback against crime, even if it meant ending people, went way beyond what Batman would ever approve of. If you're enjoying the video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Next up, let's talk about The Punisher. Frank Castle started off as a kind of hero who did bad stuff for what he thought were good reasons, but as time went on, things got way darker. He stopped caring about the reasons and just went full throttle into violence. He used to have this code, this idea that he was taking out the bad guys for a purpose, but now it's like he doesn't even need a reason. If he deems somebody as evil, they're as good as toast in his book. I mean, this guy's done some seriously messed up stuff. We're talking about ripping out people's guts with his bare freaking hands. And get this, he's taken out more people than you would even want to imagine. Literally upwards of like 50,000. It's hard to see how he could get any more brutal than he already is. Next up is the comedian from the Watchmen series. Edward Blake, known as the comedian, was a vigilante who towed the line between heroism and downright cruelty. He saw the world as a messed up place and believed that people were just as naturally messed up too. While he did fight on the side of good, it's really hard to call Blake a hero. I mean, come on, he didn't sign up for the gig to protect the good guys. He did it because he enjoys hurting the bad ones. Sadistic to be sure. As proof of this, he joined up with a sketchy government program and did some awful things in the Vietnam War. And the comedian didn't regret any of it. In fact, he was almost proud of how far he went. He even attempted to assault his own teammate, Silt Spectre. Now, the comedian is an anti-hero by definition. He fought on the side of the good, sure, but his dark side was a lot darker than most. He was a mix of violence, nihilism, and twisted morals all wrapped into one messed up package. Next Next up, let's talk Blade. So a good rule of thumb for comic book characters is that if you wield the sword, you're probably gonna teeter more towards extreme violence, given that swords come with obligatory dismemberment. But when you're literally named after said weapon, you're basically committed to sticking yourself in the brutality box. Now the thing is, Blade stands out in the Marvel world because he's one of those characters that writers use to unleash their most horrifyingly violent ideas.
because why? Well, I mean, vampires aren't exactly garnering a lot of sympathy from the audience, so there aren't many tears shed when they bite the dust. And Blade, he gets that. He knows there's not much space for being nice and decent when you're literally fighting against vampires. So he brings an intensity that's seriously off the charts. Like, consider how if Blade decided to go after regular humans with that same lethal penchant, he'd probably be recognized as Marvel's most brutal supervillain. But hey, he's sticking to the bloodsuckers. Still, makes you wonder how far an anti-hero can go before they cross the line. Next, let's talk about Black Adam. Black Adam seriously did not start out that heroic. In fact, he's done some things that even the nastiest bad guys would find disturbing. Black Adam is a story of good intentions gone haywire. He was given powers to help out, but ended up being all about himself. First, he offed his own nephew in order to get the other half of the power bestowed onto them by the wizard Shazam. Definitely not exactly a heroic origin story. Later on, he became a ruler thinking that he knew what justice was all about, but instead of playing by the rules, he did some seriously messed up things like orchestrating unalivings and going on what was essentially a meaningless rampage that ended loads of innocent people's lives in a country called Bailey just because he was upset about not being able to find the bad guys right away. Definitely would not describe that as heroic. Now even though there are technically worse villains out there, his actions were so bad that basically every hero ever teamed up to take him down at one point or another. And yet, he is still considered a hero himself, Wolverine. Wolverine right from the get-go was one tough and kind of scary dude. His story is far from sunshine and rainbows. Like he's been through some seriously tough stuff. Like his Backstory is just riddled with tragedy. He accidentally offed his parents. He's been living since like the 16th century and has watched everyone he knows and loves age and perish, except for his brutal nemesis that won't leave him or his loved ones alone. He got experimented on against his will to have adamantium fused to his skeleton. I mean, the guy's been through the ringer, so I, I guess that somewhat justifies all the horrible things he's done, but come on. Did you really have to visit Matsuo every year just to chop off one of his body parts? Even he thought being killed would have been more merciful. I mean, sure, the X-Men did try to help him be more human, but when you literally start off your career as a living weapon, it's kind of tough to shake that off. Sometimes they even used his animalistic tendencies to their advantage, as Wolverine is definitely not the type to back down. No, no. When someone threatens peace or hurts innocence, he's out there, claws out, ready to bring the pain. And let me tell you, when when Wolverine does go all out, it's nothing short of jaw-droppingly intense. He might have gone a bit too far sometimes, but for him, it's all about protecting those who can't protect themselves. And dealing out a whole lot of pain to those he believes deserves it. Harley Quinn. When we're talking about someone whose origin stories had her literally falling in love with the most diabolical maniac in all of Gotham, nay, in all of DC, saying that her morality is ambiguous is a vast understatement. She used to be a villain who would not hold back on brutality, even when it came to youngsters like the Robins. But then things flipped. Post-52, she took a turn aiming to do some good with a little bit of heroic retribution. In the new 52, she wore the anti-heroine cape, trying to balance out the scales by fighting on the side of justice. One of her big moments was when she faced off against the Joker, and even more notably when she helped the Suicide Squad. I mean, clearly she's on this path to redemption. And who knows, perhaps she's inching closer and closer to becoming a full-blown hero. Probably not. Next on the list is Deadpool. Wade Wilson's got this thing for violence, which is like his go-to solution for just about everything. Now he can and has shown the potential to be a great villain, like that time he eliminated everybody in the Marvel Universe. But deep down, he's not all bad. Despite his love for chaos and mayhem, he sort of means well. He takes on the bad guys specifically, but he does it in a way that's a little extreme. Like, Sorry, seriously extreme. Making puppets out of enemies' leftovers? Yeah, that's way over the line. Eating the remains of his enemies? Absolutely bonkers. But in his mind, it's all part of fighting the good fight. He's a chaotic good guy, twisted, crazy, but somehow still on the side of good. Seems like nothing is below Deadpool. He, like, he was even willing, ready, and capable to become the Herald of Galactus. He literally shot a dude in the noggin just because he said he enjoyed the Star Wars 
prequels. Going too far? Try never far enough. And last on our list, we have Batman. Yeah, plot twist. Bet you didn't expect good old bats on this list, did ya? That's right, y'all. Though he's touted as a hero, what with his rule about not ending lives and not using any lethal weapons like firearms, he's definitely crossed the lethal line on more than one occasion. Let's rewind to the early days, shall we? Back then, like in Batman number one, for example, Hugo Strange pulls off this stunt where he turns some men mentally ill folks into giants. Now dealing with these giants wasn't exactly a cakewalk for Batman, leaving him to resort to some extreme measures to deal with people who were formerly just innocent mental patients. For one of these poor suckers, he actually hung him from the bat plane. Yeah. That happened. There was this other time where he was just unwilling to deal with the KG beast anymore, so he literally left him to rot trapped in a sewer. If he proves anything, it's that you don't really need flashy weapons to be an anti-hero. Really, all you gotta do is break a few rules. Coming in at number 10 is Thor starting a war. Now Thor didn't travel to Earth originally to become a superhero. He was banished to Midgard by his father, Odin, because he was a big old meathead jerky jerk. Basically, he got super grounded. The full account of how this went down first appeared in the Mighty Thor number 159. A long, long time ago, Asgard signed a treaty with Niflheim, land of the storm giants bringing peace to both worlds. Now, I know in the Thor movie, it's Jotunheim, and Niflheim is actually the realm of Hela, but that's what it was in the comics, so that's what we're gonna go with. Now, as part of the agreement, no Asgardian is permitted inside of Niflheim, but that didn't stop Thor. As a young warrior, Thor saunters right into Niflheim while hunting a monster, and when the giants retaliate, since Thor broke the agreement, Thor starts attacking them with his hammer. Now, Thor's buddy Baldur shows up and bails him out before it goes too, too far, but it doesn't really save him. Weirdly enough, Odin's actually actual breaking point comes later on when Thor transforms an arm wrestling contest into a full on bar brawl. That is the incident that forces Odin to trap Thor in a frail human body, wipe away all of his memories of godhood, hide Mjolnir, and banish him to Earth. Now, until he can learn his humility, he'll have to somehow survive on Earth as a well-educated, handsome, mortal doctor with a lovely girlfriend. Must be so hard. Number 9, Wolverine. The world of Old Man Logan is a pretty bleak one. This post apocalypse came to be when the villains decided that instead of fighting their usual villains, who they always lose to, they would instead put themselves up against whatever hero they were actually best suited to face. In the case of Wolverine, that happened to be Mysterio. Mysterio is a master of creating illusions that trick even the senses, and he is almost always defeated by Spider-Man, usually because of his spider sense. But for Logan, his super senses are one of his key traits, so when Mysterio uses his illusions to trick those senses into believing believing that the X-Mansion was being attacked by Doc Ock, Ulysses Claw, Strife, and a whole squad of powerful villains, Wolverine held nothing back. Using his claws, he cut through the villains like butter. With all the other X-Men nowhere to be found, it was Wolverine versus everyone, and he was taking all 40 villains to the grave. Now when he finally took down the last one, Bullseye, the illusion was lifted to reveal that these villains were in actuality his fellow X-Men, who were just caught completely off guard by the sudden attack from one of their own. It led Wolverine to almost take his own life, and then to commit to never popping his claws again, until, well you'll have to read the old man Logan story. Sorry. Number 8. Punisher. The Punisher kills the Marvel Universe in and of itself is pretty much an entire story of a superhero going way too far. Only, he isn't even really super, he's just really, really dedicated. Punisher loses his family when they are caught in the crossfire of the superheroes facing the invading Skrulls in Central Park. Now Frank straight up takes the lives of four heroes right there and then. He is then arrested but charged by a group of other people who have been similarly affected by the superheroes to literally wipe out all super beings on the planet Earth. It is nuts. There are tons of things from the comic that we could talk about, but I think I'd like to focus on one moment. It's how the Punisher destroys Doctor Doom. After going through Spider-Man, Venom, the Hulk, and Kingpin, and his entire crew, Frank gets arrested for the second time. Now, once he is again freed, the Punisher goes to Latveria to attack none other than Doctor Doom. While Doom would normally crush Frank with absolutely no problem, the Punisher manages to attach a magnetic mine to Doom's mask that, thanks to the feedback, destroys every single one of Doom's robotic counterparts to make sure that Frank is fighting the true Doctor Doom. It then goes off. Doom 
doing a number on Doom, but not wiping him out. Which gives Frank enough of an advantage that he can now pick up a hammer and cling clang clang on Doom's noggin until it goes squish. That's what the comic says. Number 7, Thor against the Thing and Spider-Man. We're back with Thor again in the finale of the 2011 five issue miniseries Thor First Thunder. A new origin for Thor came to us when he shows up in New York City. The problem is, this ain't the Thor we all know and love. Instead, this is an unhinged and uncontrolled Thor as Loki has taken over his brother's mind to make him commit some pretty heinous acts. One of the biggest would be fighting the other heroes. In the climactic fight in the destroyed remnants of Manhattan, Thor and Loki basically wipe out the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. Reed is trapped in an unsolvable mathematic equation that drives him insane, and Johnny Storm is sent to Jotunheim, the realm of the Frost Giants. The Invisible Woman has her powers reversed so that instead of creating a force field that protects her, she is crushed by it, but the worst comes for the Thing and Spider-Man. Shooting a web at Thor's hammer, Thor throws his enchanted hammer all the way into space, where Spider-Man quickly succumbs to the oxygen-free environment. And the hammer then returns to Thor, who uses it to knock the bottom half of the Thing's jaw clean off of his face. It's crazy. There's at least a happy ending after Thor breaks free of his hypnosis, cause he's so upset that his father Odin reverses everything and erases the world's minds of their memory. Number 6, Colossus and Magic vs Spider-Man. In the Avengers vs X-Men event, a group of 5 X-Men were granted quite the power boost in the form of the Phoenix Force, which came to Earth for Hope Summers. Now thanks to Tony Stark, it was split into 5 parts, and that's what it inhabited the bodies of those 5 X-Men. The mutant siblings Colossus and Magic were two of these X-Men. Now in the ninth issue of the event, Spider-Man buys the rest of the Avengers time to escape by placing himself in between these two godly powered mutants and the rest of his team. Spider-Man got completely beaten to a pulp. Every time they knocked him down, he got up again and continued to fight, even with Colossus smushing his face, stomping on his spine and blasting him with energy. It was honestly kind of hard to sit through. He still has that whole charming personality and beautiful brain though. Even though he was completely wrecked, Spider-Man gives them a little innocent reminder of the fact that if one of them is defeated, the other one will gain even more power. Now we don't get to see the fight that takes place between the two of them, instead we get to see the unconscious bodies of both of them, with Spider-Man still barely standing to let everyone know he got them to knock each other out. But they still completely wrecked the web slinger, it was brutal. Number 5, King Thor. Thor number 68 flashes forward to the year 2020, which it was in the past for us, but that doesn't matter. When a war between humans and the gods ended with Thor in charge of the whole world. New York is a wasteland, ravaged by an attack that also leveled Asgard. Every human baby is registered at birth and monitored just in case they become potential threats to the Asgardian regime. Resistance movements, including the ones led by the Avengers themselves, were quelled in rather violent fashion. Loki and the Enchantress serve as Thor's primary advisors and help him re-educate any rebels that may arise, including Jane Foster. This rule over the Earth lasts for hundreds of years. Now over time, Thor using Asgard's technology eliminates famine, war, and poverty, which is great, but he also locks up unbelievers in reconditioning centers where Loki makes them compliant using magic. Humanity basically loses its will to live, leaving buildings unfinished and refusing to strive for anything better because basically with no problems, there's no point in doing anything. So when Thor falls into the Odin sleep, which is necessary for him to restore his powers, Loki and the Enchantress take over. And it goes about as well as you might expect. Now thankfully this all gets set right thanks to some time travel and Thor's son showing just how disappointed he is in his own father, but now Thor is well aware of the fact that in a possible future, he could have ruined everything. Number 4, Batman and Robin. All star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder is something else. Taking place in Frank Miller's Batman universe, this version of Batman is kinda just crazy. He is a jerk, and he does some very strange things. Like in issue number 9, Green Lantern comes to Gotham to confront this new Batman on his methods of fighting crime, which involves Batman trying to basically just terrify criminals. Now Batman agrees to meet in one of his safe houses. He gets his Robin to paint the entire inside of the safe house yellow. Like the entire thing from floor to ceiling. Even he and Robin completely completely cover themselves in yellow paint. Now this is specifically because it completely depowers Hal Jordan. As Batman tries to convince Hal that his new Robin is not Dick Grayson, he lies and says that Robin is a protege from Istanbul with the fastest hands you've ever seen and a whirling dervish in a fight. 
right. To prove that, Robin stole Green Lantern's ring right off of his finger without him even noticing. Now Hal goes to get his ring back and Robin shows him the error of his ways as he basically dances around the lantern and knocks him to the ground. Unfortunately though, he gets a little carried away and decides to hit Lantern right in the neck, essentially crushing the windpipe. Batman then tosses Robin into a wall, following it up with a punch to the face which was kind of unnecessary, and immediately performs a tracheostomy on Hal to save his life. Number 3. Iron Man. Marvel's first Civil War put Tony Stark Iron Man in an interesting position. While his superhuman registration act could be seen as a good thing, his methods of enforcing that act is where he really went wrong. For example, when Tony couldn't get into contact with Thor to ask him to join his side of the conflict, he instead decided to use the Asgardians genetic info without his permission, teaming up with Hank Pym and Reed Richards to create a robotic clone of Thor called Ragnarok, with a huge amount of almost godly power. While it seemed like a perfect way to turn the tide of the conflict, it turned out to actually be too effective. It doesn't take long for the Thor clone to become much too violent and it ends up blowing a hole right through the chest of the hero Goliath, taking his life. This moment led heroes such as Spider-Man to switch over to the anti-registration camp. But what's worse is that Ragnarok managed to remain on the loose for a significant period of time after this happened. But as you can imagine, when Thor eventually came back, he wasn't exactly pleased about the situation. Number 2. Moon Knight In Charlie Houston's 2006 Moon Knight run, in the second issue, Mark recalls how he ended up in a wheelchair. And it was all because of this little fight he had with his nemesis, Bushmaster. Now in a flashback, the two are brutally fighting along the rooftops until Bushmaster savagely throws Mark off of the roof and he crashes down bouncing on and off of a fire escape below, breaking and crushing both of his knees. It's brutal with a capital B, but this is Moon Knight. Thinking he'd won, Bushmaster comes in for the final hit, but Mark lands multiple crescent darts deep in the villain's neck. But Mark isn't finished there. He then climbs on top of his nemesis and using another dart he basically relieves Bushmaster of his face, giving him a look that resembles what his mask used to be, a face with the skin removed. It's kind of terrifying. Now some things that Moon Knight does can be argued as justified to solve a crime, or save a victim, or to just teach a lesson. But Moon Knight, I kind of think he took pleasure in this one. And finally, in at number one today, it's Oliver Grayson. Now everyone who has seen the Invincible animated show knows about Omni-Man going bananas and wiping out the Guardians of the Globe and fighting his own son Invincible. But one character that only very recently got introduced is Oliver. Oliver is Omni-Man's next son after Mark, and he grows quick. Now in the comics, when Oliver was about yay high, he was going by the name Kid Omni-Man. And he was assisting Invincible as almost like his protege or like his sidekick or something like that. Now Mark was trying to show him the ropes. In issue 52, a situation is going down with the Mahler twins and Invincible goes to intervene. Now he actually starts to end up being defeated, but Oliver prematurely rushes off to help. When the twins fire off a nuclear boom boom, Mark rushes off to go subdue that threat and tells Oliver to fall back. Oliver does not. Instead, while fighting the Mahler twins, he goes a little bit overboard and flies straight through one of them, covering himself in innards. At the sight of this, the second Mahler twin completely just relents and gives up. But Oliver ain't about that, and he punches his fist straight through the Mahler's face, ending both Mahler twins extremely quickly. The real problem is that even after he did it though, he doesn't understand why it was wrong. Starting off with Bishop's betrayal of the X-Men during 2007. Seven's Messiah Complex. This story revealed how far the time displaced mutant is willing to go to change the future for the better. Bishop comes from a dark future where mutants and humanity had eventually gone to war, and he eventually ended up trapped in the present. He became an X-Man, and he served on a number of teams off and on over the years, even being Professor X's personal bodyguard for a while, and he was just incredibly popular. Now after the decimation event depowered almost all the mutants on Earth, the birth of Hope Summers signaled hope for the mutants as she was the first mutant born since the decimation, and she was an incredibly powerful one too. But 
Bishop's past came back to haunt him, convincing him that Hope was the cause of the dark future that he came from. He betrayed the X-Men and planned to take out Hope before she could grow up and change the world forever. He set off Nano Sentinels within the One Sentinel Squad, taking down the human pilots and pitting the Sentinels against the X-Men. He then ambushed Forge in the chaos, laying a trap to capture Cable, who was protecting Hope, and end Hope's life. By the end of the event, Bishop had to flee the the X-Men after firing on Hope and instead accidentally striking and nearly killing Charles Xavier. Now in the comic book universe, Hank Pym and his partner Janet Van Dyne were not only heroes in a relationship like in the MCU, but they were founding members of the Avengers. Their life together was also not as seemingly well structured as it was in the MCU, especially when Hank experienced a mental breakdown after being suspended from the team. He accidentally dropped and smashed some vials containing various unknown gases, and the released gases gave Pym a radical temporary personality change that was basically a severe case of schizophrenia. He took the new identity of Yellow Jacket, kidnapped Van Dyne, and proposed marriage to her as Pym had long wanted to do that. Now realizing that Yellow Jacket was really Pym, Van Dyne decided to just play along, fearing that she would worsen his psychological condition if she did otherwise. Their relationship was bad, with Pym feeling like a useless scientist the whole time and being jealous of his wife's success as a fashion designer. It all took a disturbing turn, however, when Hank physically struck Janet, highlighting the troubling depths to which he had sunk. But then, in order to try and save face, Hank organized an attack on the Avengers by a rogue robot that he intended to defeat himself. But Hank didn't defeat it, Janet did, and Hank got booted from the team for his absolutely insane actions. But speaking of the Avengers, during the Avengers vs X-Men event, Cyclops became a host for the Phoenix Force alongside four other mutants. Now possessed by the Phoenix, Cyclops actually de-lifed Professor Xavier, which was a huge betrayal as for a long long time, Cyclops was Professor X's golden boy, and Professor X was like his pops. As arrogant and manipulative as Charles Xavier was, no one doubted his dedication to the cause or his love for his students, especially Scott, but his motivation for doing it was a bit more of just being a villain than anything else. And it was only Xavier whose life was lost, and he's died like eight times, so it's not the biggest loss in the world. Afterwards, Cyclops adopted a much more revolutionary attitude though, leading a rebellious team of X-Men and creating some way more compelling X-Men stories to boot, so it kind of came up roses. Kind of. But back to Professor X, he has a history of just impulsively wiping and manipulating people's minds. It's not good and it never goes well in the long run, but for some reason, he just keeps doing it, even to those that he considers friends and colleagues. One of the worst examples of this came in giant sized X Men number one. Charles Xavier had to put together a brand new X Men team thanks to the fact that his original X group was being held captive by the living island Krakoa. However, we later learn that this new team wasn't the only one, because Professor X already sent another new squad of X-Men to save his original team, and they were all horribly killed. Vulcan, Sway, Darwin, and Petra all seemed to perish at the hands of Krakoa, and rather than admit his poor decision making got a bunch of mutants killed in action and just taking responsibility, Charles just erased the minds of everyone who knew about this team, including Vulcan's older brother, Cyclops, who then became Xavier's little boy scout. This came back with a vengeance and bit Xavier in the wheels when Vulcan turned out to be alive and came back for some vengeance. Now moving away from the X-Men, the Sentry is a character that I feel many people are about to become very familiar with thanks to him now being cast in the MCU, which is super exciting. This guy has the power to destroy pretty much anybody in the Marvel Universe with his powers being often called the equivalent to a million exploding suns, which is is a lot of power. He has reassembled his own molecules and taken out the Molecule Man for an example of how powerful he is. He's almost too powerful to include in a lot of stories, but it's the uh, fight, I guess you could call it, between the Sentry and Ares, the literal god of war in issue 2 of Marvel's Siege event, that left people fully aware of how far this guy can go, and with such ease that it's actually terrifying. Ares, the Greek god of war in this story, started out on the Dark Avengers before redeeming himself and 
and joining the good guys. This literal god had been showing how awesome he was, taking on the bad guys, and then he turns his sights on Norman Osborn. Unfortunately, Norman has the sentry as his bodyguard here. Sentry punches Ares halfway across Asgard, and maybe two or three punches later, he just grabs both ends of the God of War and just rips him completely in half. Question, how do you guys feel about Disney's MCU TV shows? I know some of them are really, really good, and some are a little bit harder to like, but people seem to be mixed when it came to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This show actually had some really awesome some surprisingly graphic moments, and one of them stands out among the rest. This takes place after Steve Rogers has stopped being Captain America, so instead, John Walker has taken up the Captain America mantle on orders from the government. Now, as comic book fans know, John Walker is not the greatest guy around, and in the MCU, it's pretty much no different. In one of the most shocking and dark scenes from the show, from the entire MCU to be honest, in episode 4, after the Flag Smashers just caused the passing of Walker's best friend Lamar, John chases down one of the Flag Smashers, and in front of an entire crowd of people, he very, very brutally uses the shield of Captain America to bring the Flag Smasher to an end. The bloody shield of Captain America is such a surprising thing to see, especially out of the MCU, where it's all been Disney-fied, and it honestly left everyone who saw the scene for the first time slack-jawed and just lost for words. But. What inspired that amazing scene? I'll tell you, it's the Ultimate Universe. In Ultimates number 12, Captain America is caught in a fight with Herr Kleiser, who is an old German rival of his. Now just for better context here, Herr Kleiser is actually one of the Chitauri, and they launched a full-scale invasion of Earth in the modern day, which gave Captain America the opportunity to put Kleiser down for good. So Herr Kleiser is naked for some reason following a fiery explosion, and the two are going punch for punch, with Kleiser even getting the upper hand on Captain America and ranting about eating Steve's face. It's weird. Now after Nick Fury tries to intervene and Kleiser tries to make Cap surrender, America finally gets the upper hand. Captain America pins Kleiser down, lifts his shield above his head just like in the MCU, and he slams it down edge first right into Kleiser's chest, basically slicing the guy in half. Then Captain America insults the country of France. It's just what happened. But to jump back for a little bit, John Walker's little shield smashing scene actually kind of reminds me of something that the Punisher would do. Punisher being a regular guy has to come up with some pretty inventive ways of dispatching criminals and super criminals. Usually it involves heavy weaponry, but he tossed a guy to a great white shark, he tossed one to wolves in a zoo, he's disintegrated the Hulk with magic, and even smothered a guy with a much larger guy. A pretty intense fight that I love to talk about is when Punisher defeated Wolverine by parking a steamroller on top of him. But if we're talking superheroes going just way over the top and way too far, the Punisher moment that takes the cake would have to be when he faced the entire Marvel Universe. In this alternate world, it's a superhero battle, not a crime that brings an end to Frank's family. Because of that, Frank Castle took down everyone. Literally every hero and villain. I think it's the final fight with Daredevil, however, that really hits though. It's a slog fest, and Frank doesn't realize what he's done till Matt Murdock, who happened to be Frank's childhood friend, pulls off his mask before he passes away, which then prompts Frank to turn on himself, and it left everyone reading it just super depressed. We're gonna move on from that. Enough about Punisher. What about? Zombies. In Marvel Zombies number two, zombie Peter Parker and Luke Cage leave the group of cosmically superpowered zombies and they regain their good guy nature, going on to try and protect what's left of humanity on Earth. Unfortunately, they get teleported to a different reality by Malcolm Cortez's son. In Marvel Zombies Returns, the zombie heroes, Spider Man and Luke Cage, end up on Earth 91126. Zombie Spider Man thinks that he can cure their zombie virus by finding the lifeline tablet. But just as he's getting underway with his plan, he gets distracted and forced into a fight with this reality's Dr. Octopus, Electro, Mysterio, Vulture, Kraven, and Sandman. The Sinister Six. Despite trying his best to hold back his hunger, Spider-Man can't really resist Kraven's scent, and he kind of ends up attacking him, biting into his neck. Mysterio tries using illusions to try and fend him off, but Spider-Man's senses help him locate and dispose of Mysterio 
very quickly. Electro and Dr. Octopus try to attack Spider-Man together, but this just puts them in positions to hurt each other instead, with Electro using up most of his power and Dr. Octopus left electrically deep fried for Spider-Man to eat later on. As they realize this is not going to go well, the remaining two just try to hightail it out of there, but before Vulture can escape, Spider-Man literally rips off his wings and uses them to finish off Electro before he can shoot more electricity. Only Sandman manages to survive from the chaos going to attack this universe's Spider-Man for this utterly sickening display of brutality. It's insane. But that's a zombie Spider-Man from another universe. The real Spider-Man has gone overboard on his own on a few occasions. When Spider-Man was in possession of the symbiote suit, he was not his normal self. He was much, much more ruthless and Spider-Man can already knock criminals into a coma when he's pulling his punches. The death of Gene DeWolf is one story that took place during this time and it's one of the best Spider-Man comics of all time. One of the superhero's closest allies in the NYPD gets taken out by a villain named Stanley Carter, aka Sin Eater. Both Spider-Man and Daredevil team up to hunt Sin Eater down, but when Spider-Man interrupts Sin Eater from attacking Betty Brant and almost wiping her out, Spider-Man starts to lay into the guy, beating the snot out of Stanley while giving him an earful. Peter goes so far that Daredevil notices his heartbeat pounding way too hard and he attempts to pull Peter off of the already beaten villain. He has to try and defend the criminal from Peter Parker, who is seemingly pretty much gonna take him to the grave. Daredevil says, if you want him, you'll have to come through me. And that was probably not the best choice of words because the very next panel shows Daredevil flying out through a window. If it wasn't such a serious moment, I would laugh. And honestly, I did laugh anyways. Is that wrong? I don't know. I can't really help it. Sorry. Number 10, Storm. In Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, Issue 147, Storm finds herself turned into a living chrome statue by Dr. Doom. When her fellow X-Men arrive to release her, she is enraged from being trapped as a statue. Her fear of claustrophobia allows her to connect with her powers in a way she never has before. She rages and unleashes a storm that encapsulates the entire world as she becomes one with the planet and its elements. Fortunately, her fellow X-Men are able to talk her down, likening her to the Phoenix and reminding Storm of Jean's fate when she too was corrupted by power and turned to the dark side. That allows her to let go of all that rage and all that intense power that she is feeling and make her no longer a threat to the entirety of the Earth. This allows us to see from an early stage just how awesome Storm's powers were. Needless to say, when she was confirmed as Omega, those of us that had been with the X-Men since Volume 1, I'm sure, were gleeful at the news and unsurprised. Of course Storm is Omega, she's on goddess levels. Number 9, Vulcan. Vulcan is the other Summers brother. They're Cyclops, Havoc, and Vulcan. Gabriel Summers, however, is maybe mm, the worst of the three, although both Alex and Scott have had their moments. Vulcan toiled to seize the Shi'ar Empire for himself after marrying Deathbird. When his father, Corsair, demanded that Vulcan stop his ruthless pursuit of power, Vulcan killed him, declaring himself emperor and caused a great rift in the Shi'ar Empire, plunging it into a civil war. He was also also just a generally awful brother to Havoc. Not cool. Number 8, Jamie Braddock. Jamie Braddock, also known as Monarch, was originally the cool, non-powered older brother to Betsy and Brian Braddock. He was in charge of running the family business, Braddock Industries, and was really good at it. Unfortunately, that didn't last. His family was targeted by a villain, and afterwards, Jamie began to get involved in gambling and criminal activity. As a result, he ended up being kidnapped by Dr. Crocodile, who sought to punish him for his wicked, wicked deeds. Jamie was driven insane, but this also caused his reality-altering powers to be triggered, leaving him crazy but quite powerful and for a time obsessed with wearing speedos what is up with that is that what happens when you when you have your like all your reality altering powers activated. My reality altering powers are activated. I must wear a speedo. He went on to attack the British superhero team Excalibur, brainwash children, and poison Black Widow, and always ends up being a problem brother who, when you think you can trust him, you actually can't, and who, when you think he's dead, he probably isn't. Number 7, Magneto. While Magneto may do what he does for what he believes is a just cause, there are still times when even he himself seems to be crossing his own lines. While Professor Xavier has often been an advocate for achieving peace and coexistence between mutants and humans, Magneto has seen the challenges between the two groups to mean that coexistence is really not possible. The way he sees things, it's mutants versus humankind. But even he took things too far when in Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, Issue 500, after he had regained his powers, he used them to make Sentinels attack the X-Men. 
Sentinels! The very things that threaten the existence of all mutants. The nerve. Number 6. Jean Grey. Oh, where to begin with Jean Grey? Being as powerful as she is opens up Jean to a lot of darkness. And when she ends up merging with the Phoenix Force, she ends up becoming corrupted by the power she manages to tap into, becoming, well, Dark Phoenix. As Dark Phoenix, she committed genocide, destroying the entirety of the Dabari race when she absorbed the power of their sun, causing it to supernova and destroying their planet and everyone on it. Beyond that, she also antagonized Emma Frost, telepathically torturing her. Sure, Emma Frost stole Scott Summers away, but I really don't think she deserved to be tortured for it. Besides, if there is anyone to blame in that scenario, it really, it really should be Scott himself. You two ladies, just calm down. Number five, Strife. Strife is a clone of Cable who was created in case Cable did not survive his technovirus illness. Strife himself has no such technovirus as a result, but ended up being kidnapped and raised by Apocalypse, causing him to become pretty villainous, which I guess is kind of like a virus in a sense. It's like a moral virus. He was the one responsible for unleashing the legacy virus on the world when he sent the canister it was contained in to Mr. Sinister, telling him that it contained important genetic materials belonging to the Summers line, and causing Mr. Sinister to open it, unleashing the legacy virus. While the legacy virus was stopped, it was considered one of the greatest threats to mutant kind. Beyond that, Stripe also looks super cool, too cool in my opinion, for a villain, as it makes me want to be on his side of things. Stop seducing me to join the dark side with your stylish suit of armor, Stripe. Number 4, Legion. David Haller is the son of Charles Xavier and Gabrielle Haller. As a child, he was scarred from witnessing a terrorist attack while in Beirut, and this caused him to develop a split personality disorder. Each personality that lives within him, and sometimes even without him, is fully independent and exhibits its own mutant ability, meaning that the access that Legion has appears to be almost limitless when it comes to all the different powers he can at times possess. It's not really his fault that he has a tendency to take things too far, as the damage he does is often caused by his mental disorder. When he is able to demonstrate control over his powers, he can actually be quite helpful, even fighting alongside the X-Men and his father Professor X. That is when he's not being, well, kind of evil. But when he loses control, his abilities tend to manifest in unpredictable ways. He once blew up an entire facility after losing control of his powers. Number 3, Nate Gray. Nate Gray is the son of Jean Gray and Scott Summers from the alternate Earth 295. He does not need a body to exist and has reformed himself from energy after his apparent death. Ergo, he doesn't need to eat, breathe, drink, or sleep either. He he can also exist outside of all realities as well. He is known for being one of, if not the, most powerful psionist in the Marvel Universe. While he may not be as strong as he once was, you know, before he became a shaman and gained a better sense of discipline and control, he was drastically wild and overpowered. He had very little control over the insane level of telekinetic, telepathic, and matter manipulation powers that he possessed. He could cloak himself and others, making himself appear invisible. He once destroyed an entire moon with his telekinesis, and he has stated before that he was created to destroy worlds. That's just how dangerous and powerful Nate Gray can be. Number 2, Franklin Richards. Franklin Richards has created more than one universe, including a pocket universe that he used to save a bunch of heroes, including his parents from villain Onslaught. By the way, it was in a little rubber ball. It's pretty cute. He has also resurrected Galactus, granted after discovering that the universe couldn't really continue to exist without that cosmic being. And he is powerful enough to kill celestials. But despite all this power, Franklin has often been shown as using his power for good, not for bad. Still, the amount of power he has seems so ludicrous that I would argue he still needs to be stopped simply for this reason. Sure, we can trust him right now, but if someone can manipulate this currently young mutant, it could result in complete chaos and disaster. Let's not forget that this is a child who had to have his mind shut down by his father, Mr. Fantastic fantastic at one point because it was just so dangerous. He got a dangerous mind, he's too powerful. As Galactus stated at the end of History of the Marvel Universe, Franklin Richards is the most powerful mutant ever born, which also makes him one of the most unstoppable and most dangerous. Number 1, Matthew Malloy. Who could possibly be more Omega and more potentially dangerous than Franklin Richards himself who can manipulate reality? Well, Another mutant who also has the ability to manipulate matter. 
Matthew Malloy. He accidentally killed Emma Frost using his abilities after she hit him and he just shouted stop it, deleting her from existence. Malloy himself was kind of written out of existence, but before that he was known for creating the largest power signature on Cerebro ever. In fact, Professor Xavier was forced to put mental blocks on him just to stop him from accidentally wreaking havoc on the world with his limitless power. Matthew's power actually comes from another dimension like Cyclops, which is why it also appears to be the inexhaustible kind. However, after Xavier's death, his power's mental barriers started to deteriorate, causing him to become very, very dangerous. Any surge of emotion can trigger his abilities. He once threatened to destroy the entire state of South Carolina with a potential energy blast, and his telepathic and telekinetic abilities are off the charts. So he would be, he would be one of those ones that went too far if he still existed. He gone now. Number 10, Ultimatum. Ultimatum is a now infamous event that took place in the 1610, aka the Ultimate Universe. And some felt that this storyline was the cause of that universe's downfall, that this event was so brutal, killed so many, and was so poorly received that the universe just never recovered. This storyline occurred in 2009. It was a big crossover event with five core issues, and then of course, spin-offs. The first issue sold well, but then it dropped off hard. This series is known for the amount of heroes who died and how brutally it happened. We have Magneto snapping Xavier's neck, Doctor Strange's head being squeezed till it explodes because he was wrapped in the cloak by Normammu and just But the one that got to most people was the cannibalism. When the heroes round the corner to see the blob eating the wasp, only for Hank to go full giant man and then bite off the blob's head. The thing for many fans was that this brutality just felt gratuitous, as did the deaths, more like a shock value than any narrative one. And so for many fans that made it feel cheap and it cast a pall over the series and for some, the universe. Number nine. Hail Hydra Cap. So a lot of the story came down to timing, basically how it was received, I mean, because of the political and also social climate surrounding comics, but some would never have liked it because of how it was executed, and the fact that it was the opposite of what Cap stood for. Still, this story has always had its defenders, and still does. So this story gives us a world where Cap was always a Hydra agent, the entire time, and that this was the always Cap. Not a brainwashed Cap, but always. Everything from before? all lies. This rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. The plot launched involving the Cosmic Cube would recreate the essence of Cap, but that would be from another timeline. Hydra Cap was the Cap, but it's handled in such a way that they now play it off like the recreated Cap was original Cap, but he wasn't. Never forget, because the universes were swapped Cosmic Cube, but I mean that would have made sense and it would have spared a lot of anger. The plot itself is your usual wolf in sheep's clothing, but with all the external factors it caused a lot of of anger. I'm not sure how it would have played off if it had been released years before or years later. It still would have had backlash, but would it have been as much? I want to visit some alternate dimensions. Number 8. Spider-Man Sins Past This storyline comes to us from 2004 and was an attempt to go back and add some shock value and some more agency to Gwen Stacy during the whole Night Gwen Died event. But the way it was gone about was odd. We're not supposed to talk about this one. The consensus tends to be that if we all pretend hard enough, maybe it won't have happened. Like a reverse fairy. I don't believe. I don't believe. Here it was revealed that Gwen was having an affair with Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin himself, and that she got pregnant and had twins, and that she wanted to raise these with Peter, but Norman wanted them for himself, and that's why he killed her. Agency! I've said it before and I'll say it again. The best part of this story is how when Peter finds out, his first question is whether he was still her first. Classic. Peter then has to fight their hyper-aged twins. Aside from all the plot holes this causes, it was just not well received. Most found it unnecessary and squeaky. As mentioned, most nowadays just pretend it didn't happen. Number 7. Star Fox Assault Storyline Oh Star Fox aka Eros on so many of our lists because of this. This plot here is now what this character is most known for, which tends to upset fans of his to no end, who just wish people would look at the other aspects of this character. But this plot, well it's pretty attention grabbing, let's put it that way. Star Fox had been using his power to make women fall for him. He was doing this by using his pheromone 
phones to sleep with them without their consent. And so he was put on trial with Jennifer Walters, aka the She-Hulk, as his defense lawyer, whom he had also slept with. As she would later come to wonder, was that consensual or not? It was, but her marriage to John Jameson was not. Eros had forced her to have those feelings. This whole plot was dealt with by saying that Star Fox had been manipulated since his youth, which had caused him to misuse his powers that way. And for many people, it just did not fly and left a bad taste in their mouths. And many were left wondering, just how does a character come back from that? Well, for many, he never did. Especially in this era of social media, where bringing the story up is just a click away. I mean, we're doing it right now. Number six, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Back to the ultimate verse for this one, with just an overall plot point for the twins. Pietro and Wanda in the ultimate verse are having, well, twincest. They're in an incestuous relationship. Why? Because why not? Pushing the boundaries. Also, the series stops to lecture Captain America for being squicked out by this. I'm using the word squick a lot in this video. This one falls in the just but why category. I mean, if you're not going to do anything with it, then why exactly point out was the point? Still, few who know about it can forget. Not that it happened. But is it as unpopular as these two not being Magneto's children anymore? Maybe not. I don't know. You tell me. Number five, the boys. All of it. At our midway point with The Boys, the series by Garth Ennis, where his goal was to out-preacher his other series, Preacher, to create the most out-of-control series in terms of violence and sex that he could. And well, he certainly succeeded. But for some, it's too far. And a lot of what occurs is exploitative. The period beard is a big one for a lot of people. When Wee Huey goes down in Starlight and surprise, it's her time. This video's not family friendly anymore. I'm just always like, that's unrealistic. He would taste that, unless he doesn't know what blood tastes like. I can feel some of you cringing. There was also just the entire arc that was Herogasm, which featured a superhero orgy and the assault of Wee Huey by Black Mar just cuz. Again, Ennis was aiming to be over the top, and for some people that works, but for others, they'd prefer things to be a little more reined in, or at least directed. Number four, Multiple Man Absorbs His Son. Jimmy Madrox is the multiple man. He has the ability to create duplicates of himself, and he does this sometimes for recreational purposes, including one night where him and a duplicate hooked up with two separate ladies, one of whom was Siren, who got pregnant and decided to keep the baby. Jamie was convinced he was the father of that baby, as he was sure that he had slept with her and that it hadn't been his dupe. However, in a horrifying plot point, it turned out that he had been mistaken, and when he went to hold his son Sean for the first time, the baby was reabsorbed into his body. Siren was devastated, and Jamie basically told her to get over it. When it comes to this story, not only is it really horrifying, especially if you have kids, but the fallout of Jamie just not caring essentially also rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Kinda hard to relate to a person that cold, depending upon the reader. Maybe you're into it. Like, yeah. You don't care. Number three, Nightwing raped. During Nightwing's first solo series, writers were working to establish him with his own set of baddies. This was to really get him out of Batman's shadow. One of these villains was Blockbuster, who entered essentially his arch nemesis slot for a bit. It all escalated to the point where Blockbuster was killed and Nightwing just stood by. Because of all the ingrained don't kill mentality from his time with Bruce, this shattered him, rendered him catatonic for a minute. And as Nightwing was laying on the rooftop, traumatized, Tarantula, a villain slash anti-hero involved in this whole arc, mounted him and just had her way with him, even as he asked her to stop. This was then treated as if it did not happen. Years later, the author Devin Grayson, well, she would apologize, claiming she had an arc to go with it, but she left the book before she could implement it. This contradicted an earlier statement, where she said she hadn't understood the ramifications of the plot, largely because Nightwing is a guy. There were plots like this in the 80s too, with the new Teen Titans, then they reversed it, it was a revenge plot. These plots are fine in my opinion, Opinion, though not everybody agrees with that, but you need to treat them with gravity. You need to think about it. Think it through. Number two, Identity Crisis. In 2004, DC published a story called Identity Crisis that would end up shaping many of the characters for years to come. And some have come to feel that this story went too far for several reasons. One, the transformation of Dr. Light into a rapist and the rape of Sue Dibney, the wife of the elongated man. Two, the death of the elongated man's wife and Tim Drake's father. Three, the mind wipe, not only of Dr. Light, but of Batman. That last part in particular cast the heroes in a particularly un heroic light. Even Superman, who knew about this as he sheds a single manly tear about it. The whole thing made everyone feel pretty dark and dingy. And over time, many came to feel that it had done damage to the characterizations over time. What do you think about it? Controversial. Number one, 
Captain Marvel, or Miss Marvel at that time, gives birth to her rapist, Avengers 200. I'm sure some of you are not surprised that this is number one. Avengers issue 200, any issue of that number is supposed to be an epic, a reminder of why you read the comic in the first place. Well, this giant special was essentially that episode The Lost from Star Trek TNG, but with an even creepier twist. Miss Marvel finds herself mysteriously pregnant. She has one of those hyper fast fictional pregnancies, and the team just congratulates her. They don't treat it as scary at all. They don't even get why she would be upset. Next, she has the baby, and it ages super fast, and it turns out it's her lover from another dimension, who implanted himself in her body to come to her dimension. This was the only way he could do it. And the kicker, while in his dimension, he coerced her into being his lover in the first place. So assault. And then the team encourages her to leave with him. This was a mess on so many levels. One, how is this a celebration of the Avengers 200th issue? Two, wow, how amazingly tone deaf with no thought given to larger implications. Some defend the story by saying, no, it was intentional and she came back and she called them out. But that was actually the result of other writers responding to the backlash and trying to fix it. Not a planned storyline. Yeah, not a good look. Memorable though, I'll give you that. No one's forgetting Avengers 200. Number 10, Hal Jordan recreates Coast City. So let's take this Hal going parallax thing from a different angle. Let's go back to the beginning of the descent. And this occurs after Coast City is destroyed during the death of Superman, reign of Superman stuff. So Coast City, where his family lived, gone. Seven million dead when Mongol detonated a bomb, but it turned out he had been ordered to do it by Hank Henshaw, Cyborg Superman. Hal had been in space at the time, so returned to find it destroyed, and this completely unhinged him, just the guilt of it. And after it was all settled, he was so rattled, he tried to use his ring to recreate the city. He obviously could not do it. But this was the beginning of the instability, and a sign that he was cracking. That's a creepy abuse use of ring power that hadn't been thought through. You know, first you're recreating cities that you just have to sit in the entire time just holding the construct up. Then you're growing Reed Richards hair streaks. Next thing you know, you're killing the entire Green Lantern Corps and blowing up in the sun. It's the natural progression of these things. But don't worry, he was possessed, so none of it counts. Number nine, Iron Man sending Hulk into space. So most people are vaguely aware of planet Hulk, but did you know how he got there? Iron Man shot him into space in the lead up to Civil War. This is because him and some of his friends, Reed, felt that the Hulk was getting out of control. He was causing too much collateral damage, too many potential deaths, because Marvel has this thing that the Hulk never kills civilians, just, yeah. It's a modern thing and was a comics code thing before that. To that I say, sure, Jan. No one's ever died in a Hulk rampage. Anyways, they felt they couldn't deal with him on Earth anymore. So why is this too far, you may ask? Are they wrong, you may be asking? Well, Marvel characters know that space is full of aliens, so it's fine for them to deal with the Hulk by just shooting him to space? where potentially other aliens can't stop him? That's ice cold Tony. This was the Tony going into Civil War though, so maximum douchery engaged. Number eight, Jean Grey outs Iceman. Let's get controversial. Let's talk about an event people are oft times afraid to talk about. So Iceman in modern continuity is gay. This was accomplished via retcon that featured time travel. But here's the thing. This wasn't a reveal Bobby came to himself. In the issue wherein this is revealed, Bobby is conflicted about his sexuality. In fact, it appears more that he's leaning towards expressing bisexuality, which would have lined up with the past big female loves of his life, which were genuine. But then Jean Grey just reads his mind and goes, Bobby, you're gay. So she reads his mind, without his consent, then interpreted what she saw there through her own lens, then told him what he thought in his own mind based on what she saw. That's a big oof for me. Can we get some cringes in the chat, please? Yeah, many felt that this was a mishandling of what could have been a really big moment, and for some people was a really big moment. But a lot of that got lost in the crutch of, if you don't like this, there's something wrong with you. It became a thing you couldn't talk about, and in some circles still can't. But no one silences me. I'll talk about what I want. Number seven, Jason Todd replaces Nightwing. So Dan Didio has long had issues with Dick Grayson as Nightwing. He doesn't get it. He's like, he's not Robin, and he's not Batman. Whose man's is this? Flip's table. So he wants two things. Well, either him dead or his name changed. Ideally both. But he got the name changed. That's why he's Rick Grayson now, which is pretty much the same thing as dead to me. Whoa, too much salt, I'm sorry. So in Infinite Crisis, Dick was supposed to die and Jason was going to become Nightwing, but the editor saved him and also writers protested. And so he got to live another day. But Jason was already Nightwing because this was pretty much a done deal. Dick Grayson's city had exploded while he was in it. He was dead. So Jason was also Nightwing for a bit and he was unhinged. He was killed. 
killing people and trying to kill Dick. This was prime insane Jason when that was what we were doing with him. It was the continuation of the greatest regret angle before the black sheep angle. Jason was slicing people's throats, leaving blood notes on walls. It was all too far. Too much. Most people have blocked this arc from their memory along with that time that Jason was a tentacle monster. But I'll never forget. Number six, Cyclops doesn't tell Jean about his wife. Let's talk about Cyclops and Jean. They are one of the iconic X-Men couples, but like Wanda and Vision, they have a pretty messed up history. After Jean died as Phoenix, before Phoenix was retconned to being a force and not her being mad with power, so basically the first parallax retcon, Scott would pick up with Madeline Pryor, a woman who looked strikingly similar to Jean. This would turn out to be because she was her clone. He married her, and the two had a son, Nathan Summers, or Nate Summers, who would grow up to become Cable after he was raised in the future. However, during all of this, Jean came back, and Scott was so thrilled he went to see her. But not only did he not tell his wife and newborn son where he was going, but he also didn't tell Jean he was married and had a kid. He would then go on to join X-Force all without telling Madeline. He would be spending the entire time convincing himself that this was the right thing to do. For many fans, this was the beginning of their hatred towards Cyclops, because he just does not come off well in this arc. Number five, Batman puts Dick in traction. This is from the Superman slash Batman crossover comic from 2003, about 54 issues in, where Batman and Superman swap powers and Batman goes a little nuts. He's just spending all his time nonstop crime fighting, chasing the knight across the globe. Dick eventually tries to take him down by waiting till he's been in the night for quite a while, so away from the sun and hence less powerful. But Dick can't take down a super powered Batman and he ends up getting horribly injured. Bruce attacks him, brutally crushing his jaw and nearly breaking his spine. The injuries are so horrific, Alfred doesn't know if he can forgive him, even if Bruce is less stable than usual because of all the powers. Batman smacks his Robins far more than I'd like, but when he does, it's always a <gasps> la gasp moment. Let's talk about a ward smack that many people forgot about in at number four. Number four, Green Arrow punches Speedy. This occurred in the famous Green Arrow Green Lantern team up comic with the cover, my ward, a junkie, wherein Green Arrow, who has a very harsh stance on drugs, which is kind of the complete opposite of how he was portrayed for the rest of the series, which is very interesting. Because that series pitted Hal and Ollie against each other ideologically. Oftentimes, it's always the more leftist person who was just berating Hal constantly for being a space cop and doing what the Guardians tell him. But in this, when he discovers that Roy Harper is on drugs, he flips out. And Speedy goes, fine, hit me if it'll make you feel better. Guess you don't know everything. And so Ollie does hit him. He just can't handle it. How could someone under his tutelage be on drugs. He doesn't lift a finger to help him either. No, it's Black Canary and Hal who help him out and see that he gets the help that he needs. Then Ollie shows up and is all, oh, I'm sorry, I overreacted. Why does no one remember this? They remember the cover, but not the contents. Too far. Be better to your wards. Stop hitting them. Number three, Dick Grayson kills the Joker. This happened, for real, in canon, not an Elseworld story. This happened in Joker's Last Laugh, a storyline wherein the Joker convinced everybody that he had a brain tumor and he decides that he's gonna go out in style. He's going ham. He creates crazy Joker rain, like falling from the sky. But Dick snaps when he finds Robin's, at the time Tim Drake's, costume shredded, and he's had enough at this point. Jason is dead, Barbara was paralyzed because of the Joker, for Tim to be gone too was just too much for him. Dick would proceed to beat the Joker to death, only for Tim and Batman to show up and for him to realize it was a ruse. He starts to have a breakdown, but Batman is able to restart the Joker's heart. But Dick killed him, that's over the line. I'm sure the people of Gotham would have been fine with it though. Just saying. Number two, Jean Grey and the Spider-Man Wolverine mind swap. This happened in the Ultimate Verse, the 1610. So here Wolverine was hitting on Jean, it was not appreciated, so she swapped his mind with the person he would least like to be swapped with, and that turned out to be Peter Parker. And while Wolverine was in Peter's body, he hit on MJ. Just the whole thing was too far. Jean can play pretty fast and loose with her powers. Poor Peter, he had no idea what was going on. He just woke up as Wolverine. I wouldn't want to wake up as Wolverine. He has lots of enemies. Also, everything would smell a lot. Also, hitting on MJ, gross. But I mean, Wolverine and Squirrel Girl, never forget. And number one, Ant-Man creeps on Carol Danvers. Now this Ant-Man isn't Hank Pym, and it's not Scott Lang. So get ready to get out your tortures and pitchforks for someone new. This is Eric O'Grady. And this happened in the irredeemable Ant-Man. So well, they named it right. This Ant-Man is just a creeper, and his thing is fun 
spying on girls in the shower. He does it to a woman he saves from a purse snatcher, follows her home, shrinks, and then he's creeping in the shower. Now Eric wasn't supposed to have a suit, he was just a low level shield agent, but he ended up getting his hands on one anyway, through a bit of a clandestine means kind. But he would fight crime, so it does count. And he would have a bit of a change of heart later on, we'll talk about that in a sec. So how did he end up peeping on Carol? Well this was cause he hid in a random woman's purse for shower purposes. And then when he gets out, it turns out that it is Carol Danvers. He spies on her and takes pictures before she notices. Gross. Grady would later vow to change and become a better hero, but this, this is hard to come back from. Look at his face in these panels. <laughs>